Podcast Acabo, and welcome to Read Aloud 11 of Caciques and Semi-Idols, the web spun by Taino Rulers between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico by Jose R. Oliver. Let's jump right into Chapter 21, Religious Syncretism and Transculturation, the Crossroads Towards New Identities. The events described by Pané during his missionary work in Hispaniola represent two responses to the advent of Catholic religion and especially of Christian icons. Clearly, some natives of the Macorís region were receptive, for whatever reasons, to catechism. But those in the Guaricano settlement in Magua, once Cacique Guariones joined the rebellion, rejected catechism and set out to destroy the icons. Native acceptance versus resistance is thus the key process involved. Resistance and rejection, for example, at Guaricano, do not require further in-depth analysis, but the processes that are implicated in acceptance, adoption, appropriation, assimilation, and so forth, require further attention, because these are at stake in the genesis of new identities in Cuba, as well as the rest of the Caribbean islands. And in these processes, the physicality of iconography and the sculptures of Aboriginal semis, saints, and virgins are as important are as important as the performances, ritual theater, enacted by humans. As Panet provided no detailed accounts of how such acceptance worked in northeastern Hispaniola, the two examples above from eastern Cuba provide useful insights. The acceptance of the sculptured by the cacique of Cueva, or painted by Comendador, virgin, is the first step towards acceptance. It is clear, at least to me, that both caciques had adopted the virgin icons and internalized selected elements of the icon's personhood, who she was, and legend, or her powers. The way in which the virgin was made to confront the traditional Indo-Cuban semis can best be interpreted as an addition to the ensemble of native semi-icons that both caciques must have had, albeit their novelty and demonstrated powers catapulted the virgin icons to the forefront. While such adoption and integration seems to be made within the ideological and religious framework of the Cuban natives, it nevertheless still points to the selective incorporation of elements from a different religious tradition. Her face, body, and attire were unlike anything they had seen before. Yet the ease with which the two virgin icons were adopted by natives in Cuba suggests that there was no stigma attached or barriers to the acceptance of foreign religious elements. There is no sense of pollution or bastardization of their religion. In short, the argument is that just as these caciques accepted in their own terms foreign or stranger Virgin Mary imbued with semi icons, so they would also be open to accept other stranger or foreign religious icons from Hispaniola, the Bahamas, and other Aboriginal societies of the Caribbean with whom they interacted. Of course, the opposite is not true. Catholic dogma considers the adoption of foreign religious icons as sinful, a bastardization, and pollution of the pure and true faith. The processes implicated in the Indo-Cuban examples recall what Melville Herskovitz famously subsumed under the concepts of acculturation, or the, quote, melting pot, end quote, ideal, through syncretism, and what the eminent Cuban scholar Fernando Ortiz redefined as transculturation in the first half of the 20th century. Although the definition of all three concepts has since evolved, their essence still refers to the question of how and why societies resist or adopt elements or entire complexes of new and foreign ideologies, practices, or material cultures. The dyad of rejection slash acceptance ought to be thought of as the endpoints of a continuum of strategies rather than an, quote, either slash or, end quote, proposition. Through syncretism, societies are continuously continually being transformed into different entities that nevertheless still selectively and contextually display echoes of their diverse, multiple heritages. David H. Brown, quoting Carl Reisman, 
provides these illuminating thoughts on secretism. In producing secretisms, creative agents, quote, remodel, end quote, or, quote, reshape, end quote, the forms of symbols to resemble as closely as possible both the historic source and the forms current in the environment. Any, quote, form that is retained, new or old, is likely to be one that can be interpreted in several ways as related to a number of traditions, end quote. In other words, syncretisms may not merely represent old wine in new bottles or new wine in old bottles, that is, masking or trans transvaluation, respectively. The historically situated performances of agents creatively change the shape of the bottles. For example, semis or virgin idols themselves into new, quote, creole, end quote, forms, which, quote, resemble, end quote, but do not reduce to their, quote, multifarious sources, end quote. In Reisman's terms, Afro-Cuban organizations, quote, took on, end quote, and, quote, remodeled, end quote, the iconography, status rankings, and processional style of encountered colonial forms, as well as elements of the slaveholders' material culture. Such dynamic processes, like syncretism, acculturation, transvaluation, masking, and transculturation, have been used in various ways to construct, sometimes engineer, individual, regional, and national identities. The ineluctable visibility of the Spanish, white, and African, or black, heritages led to a construction of identities from the 16th century onward in which the, quote, Indian, end quote, heritage had been minimized, if not erased, from official history by the emergent, politically dominant oligarchies. Phenotypes, both biological and cultural, of black and white led to prejudiced, racist, and Eurocentric categorizations, <clears throat> excuse me, ranging from white peninsular and white criollos to varying admixtures of black and white. The category of criollo in the Hispanic-influenced Caribbean, unlike the Creole of English and French colonies, did not carry the same negative connotations, albeit both are white Eurocentric constructs. Through the second half of the 20th century, the Indian heritage has gradually been reinstated in the reconstruction of identities from personal to national, most particularly in the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. The key question here is, first, whether the initial seeds of religious syncretism between Spanish Catholicism and Aboriginal Semiism, exemplified by the two Indo-Cuban cases, survived and continued to evolve into modern times, and, if so, what is the evidence? Fernando, Fernando Ortiz rejected Herskovitz's focus on assimilation, which at the time in the United States was a highly encouraged but ultimately utopian goal of the, quote, melting pot, end quote, which was to be replaced in the 1900s by multiculturalism, which in turn is now being questioned again. Ortiz famously likened Cubanidad or Cubania, i.e., quote, Cubinity, end quote, or what it means to be Cuban, to the traditional ajiaco, a stew of meatballs, vegetables, and ají pepper. Quote, the characteristic thing about Cuba is that since it is an ajiaco, its people are not a finished stew, but a constant process of cooking. Hence the change of its composition, and the fact that Cubanidad has a different flavor and consistency depending on whether one tastes what's in the middle of the pot or at its surface, where their foods, viandas, and still raw, are still raw, and the bubbling liquid still clear, end quote. In the 1900s, Ortiz's culinary metaphor had been updated by performance artist Guillermo Gomez Peña. Quote, the bankrupt notion of the melting pot has been replaced by a model that is more germane to the times, that of the menudo chowder. According to this model, most of the ingredients do melt, but more stubborn chunks are condemned to float, end quote. Syncretism, as I see it, minimally refers to the process by which separate religious ideologies and practices are amalgamated to form yet another distinct or separate coherent system.
This is an important concept because it is all about cultural mixture and debates around this concept underpin precisely the same ones raised in section 2C in connection with Taino as a quote pure and quote unmixed tradition and Tainoness, a spectrum of social entities resulting from diverse cultural heritages and face-to-face -face interactions. Syncretism is a powerful concept in reconstructing past Caribbean societies. For example, the centerpiece of Dominican archaeologist Marcio Veloz Maggiolo's rejection of Rouse's normative homogenous, i.e., quote, pure, end quote, cultures rests on his concepts of hybridization, albeit cushioned in the language of Marxism and historical materialism. Hybridization is, in this case, another way of bringing to the fore syncretism. Renier Rodriguez Ramos's and my use of the term Tainones implicitly alludes to syncretism, as well as multilinear heritage. I find Charles Schwartz's deceptively simple description of syncretism, quote, an inquiry into a cultural mixture, end quote, as the essence of its definition but it still needs further conceptual fleshing out. The above narrative of Catholic-Native Cuban relations via religious iconography and ritual is precisely about cultural mix mixing, or syncretism. But syncretism is a loaded concept that has had both negative and positive implications ever since Plutarch came up with the notion, the definition of which, since Roman times, has had many conceptual revisions. To paraphrase Stuart, most definitions of syncretism require the fusion of disparate and disharmonious elements that contravene the tenets of one or several of the, quote, initial, end quote, religious systems. Carlston Culp provided a veritable arsenal of analytical concepts for distinguishing syncretism and for comprehending its processes, synthesis, evolution, disintegration, absorption, amalgamation, equivalence, bricolage, and so on. Quote, one might almost contemplate, end quote, writes Stuart, quote, adopting a vocabulary of chemistry where compounds, mixtures, and colloids are all objectively distinguishable, but obviously religions and cultures are too complex and fundamentally subjective phenomena to be tamed by objective analytical vocabularies, however subtle, end quote. Given the premise, that there is no such thing as pure culture or religion, an anthropology of syncretism, quote, must comprehend how zones of purity and hybridity come into being, end quote. Its heuristic value exists in that it focuses attention on, quote, accommodation, contest, appropriation, indigenization, and a host of other dynamic intracultural and intercultural transactions, end quote. This is exactly the point made by David Brown in the quote above, where he uses the shape and content of, quote, bottles, end quote, as a metaphor to illustrate the process of syncretism. Stewart argued that we should not be concerned with the issue of whether this or the other religion is or is not syncretic, as all religions are a mixture of different traditions. Instead, syncretism should... 1. Study, quote, the various arguments made for or against the notion of religious mixing, end quote. 2. Quote, be concerned with competing discourses over mixture, whether syncretic, syncretic or asyncretic, end quote, and whenever syncretism occurs. 3. It should consider, quote, the commentary and registered perceptions of actors as to whether amalgamation has occurred and whether this is good or bad. End quote, since a purely objective perspective, quote, could never be sufficient, end quote. Of the three, of course, the last one is the most difficult to examine with only a recourse to 16th century chronicles. Stewart suggests that scholars should proceed with the broadest definition of syncretism, or, quote, the combination of elements from two or more different religious traditions, end quote. The previous analyses of the virgins in the hands of Cuban natives followed the spirit of Stortz's metho methodological steps. They were examined as competing discourses over the nature of the Catholic and Indo-Cuban, quote, mixture, end quote, and have explored how it may have been perceived from various perspectives, 
Native Spanish, Native Native, and Spanish Spanish, and one can at least imagine whether this initial syncretism was bad or good from these various perspectives, but with my personal bias towards understanding the natives as viewpoints. But the two Indo-Cuban examples are essentially snapshots framing short temporal spans. Because syncretism of any kind is an ongoing dynamic process, it stands to reason that gazing at a longer temporal span would provide greater insights into its varying trajectories and social effects. How did this initial syncretism, made largely in Indo-Cuban native terms, unravel through time? I will not dwell on the now well-known fact that for the next 450 years, the natives, or Indios, not just in Cuba, were excised from history and denied having any contribution to the formation of an emerging Cuban society. The myth of the rapid and total extinction, spurred by the dominant white oligarchy, led to identities that acknowledged only the multiple and diverse African heritage represented by slaves and their descendants, in large measure because, quote, blackness, end quote, was all too visible for the white class to sweep under the carpet of history. All shades and mixtures between whiteness and blackness were recognized, but on a sliding scale of white positive to black negative racist values. This history has been critically analyzed by a plethora of scholars with far greater insights and detailed knowledge than I could do justice to in this section. The analyses of The Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre by Olga Portuondo Zuniga and Maria Nersa Trincado and of The Virgen de Guadalupe del Cane de San Luis by Rolando Perez Fernandez present tantalizing evidence for syncretism originating in the kind of semiism illustrated in the case of the Cacique Comendador. The icon of the Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre probably arrived from Illescas in Spain sometimes between, sometime between 1599 and 1613, nearly a century after the Cacique Comendador's events in 1511. It was first the local virgin patron of the copper mining settlement of Las Minas del Real, now El Cobre, not far from Santiago, then the administrative center of Oriente Province. Soon, though, a legend developed of how the statuette of the Virgen appeared miraculously over the sea that, with time, up to present day, has spun several versions. The earliest written documents of the legend date to 1701, now lost, with two additional documents from 1766 and 1783 that include consequent editorial changes. This virgin is today a symbol of Cubania, or, quote, Cubanity, end quote, but in the early 17th century, the cult was more localized and in the hands of the Indios of the Oriente province. The essence of the Virgen de la Caridad legend is as follows. The virgin icon appeared to two native Indios, Rodrigo and Juan de Hoyos, and to a 10-year-old black boy named Juan Moreno. All three were residents of Barajagua la Vieja, a settlement of Indios located inland and southwest of Nipe Bay. They had left Barajagua to gather salt destined for the mining town of El Cobre. As they were at sea, a storm gathered and soon turned violent. Amid the waves, the three, quote, Juanes, end quote, as they are traditionally called, saw an object floating that turned out to be an actual icon of the Virgen, not an apparition as in most other Marian legends, such as that of the Virgen de Guadalupe de Tepeyac, Mexico. They also found a floating wood plaque that announced the Virgen's name, de la caridad, or charity. They then prayed for her help, and the Virgen enveloped them with a shining light, protecting them from the storm. All the while, the weather began to calm, and the boat miraculously eased its way to the coast. The icon was first taken to Barajagua, where a chapel was built by the Indios. The Virgen, however, disappeared mysteriously several times from the chapel, only to miraculously reappear. The Indios took this to mean that the Virgen wanted to be moved elsewhere, and with sadness, the Virgen was moved to the mining town of El Cobre. Eventually, as the Virgen's cult spread, it was moved to the regional capital city of Santiago, where it remains today. The story of the movements of the Virgen icon as her cult gained popularity, of course, hides the process of appropriation by the church and Spanish civil hierarchy, removing the Virgin of Barajagua, a town dominated and controlled by Indios.
The key ingredients of syncretism proposed by Olga Portuondo Zuniga and Maria Nelsa Trincado revolve around a number of observations of varying merits. First is the fact that two Indios and an Afro-Cuban child were the protagonists of the legend, and second, the three boys were residents of a small settlement whose population was almost entirely composed of Indios. It was thus a cult initiated by Indios and Afro-Cubans, freed and enslaved, in the largely Indio town of Barahagua. The authors point to some intriguing features, although the icon seems to have in fact come from Illescas between Madrid and Toledo, there are parts of the icon that appear to be of local manufacture. For example, the head is made of a vegetable paste and is painted over. Both of the two authors indicate that by this late date, in the early 1600s, the religion of the Indios or Indocubanos must have already been substantially syncretized. Aborigines from Yucatan, for example, post classic slash colonial Maya, from the coast of northern South America, and from other regions had been enslaved or indentured to labor in the Cuban fields, especially in the copper mines. In spite of this cultural mixture, what both authors point to as specifically Aboriginal Indio syncretism, i.e. of Taino heritage, are the conceptual similarities shared between the Virgin and one of the semis of Hispaniola. Fane stated that there was a semi that had five names, Atavera, Yermao, Guacar, Apito, Zuimaco. Pane also said that Atavera was the, quote, mother, end quote, of a high-ranking masculine semi called Yokahu Guama Baguamarocoti, who, quote, is the heaven and is immortal, and that no one can see him, and that he has a mother, end quote. Jose Juan Arom translated the first name, Atavera, as, quote, mother, Ate, of the lake waters, or Itabon, end quote, and speculates that Guacar, or Guacar, may mean, quote, moon, end quote, or, quote, menstruation, end quote. Ahron concludes that at least these names suggest a, quote, feminine deity, end quote. Her other three names have not been deciphered. The latter semi-personage is translated by Ahron as the, quote, manioc or yuca, lord, who, of the ocean, bagua, end quote, and, quote, without, ma, grandfather, Orocoti, end quote. Elsewhere, I have argued that it's possible that his first name is not Yucahu, but, following Alfonso de Ulloa's original Italianized transcription of Panes Relacion, it could be Luku, or Locohu, in which case it would mean, quote, person or local, lord, who, end quote, that is, quote, person lord of the ocean, end quote. The allusion to a, quote, mother of the lake waters, end quote, semi, who is the mother of the high-ranked masculine semi-personage who also lords over or comes from the waters, is taken by Portuondo Zuniga and Trincado as a strong point for the adoption of a Virgin Mary icon who is the mother of God and also is linked to the waters. Syncretism came about because of the shared features of mother and water. I am less convinced that this necessarily constitutes proof of a uniquely Taino in contribution, as the same notions of water and motherhood invested in icons can be found in many parts of the world, including African and Afro-Cuban icons. We do not know how Ojeda's virgin icon was interpreted by the cacique at Cueva, but we do know that the painted virgin held by Comendador was strongly linked to war and had, as far as can be judged, no bearing on water or motherhood. The Atavera example was also cited by Portuondo Zuniga and Trincado as possible evidence of the syncretic process of the syncretic processes that led to the adoption of the Virgin of Guadalupe. More on this image below. One also must be careful in drawing analogies with legends and biographies of semi specific to the Macorish Magua region in Hispaniola. Trincado also points out that the cult of this virgin led to replications of her icon by eremitas or eremitaños, i.e. hermits, who typically lived in isolation and in small structures that were both their residence and chapel. Trincado points to documents, 
purporting that the ermitas, devoted to the Virgin of the Caridad, a replica of the original, were discovered in the remote caves in the Sierra, Sierra Maestra Highlands. She argues that because worship in caves was also an aboriginal practice, syncretism must have taken place. But again, worship in caves is just as true of Catholic and Orthodox hermits in the Mediterranean as it is in Europe in general. I'm not arguing that syncretism did not take place, or that there are no aboriginal religious elements of semiism, but that the demonstration or proof is not conclusive. These are just possible points of coincidence that may be indicative of syncretism. If scholarly research is to disentangle elements of the cult, legend, and iconography of the Virgen de la Caridad de Cobre, it will inevitably turn into a frustrated exercise unless every single step of the syncretic process is exhaustively or ethnographically documented. That gap between 1511 and the early 1600s is too vast, especially with the influx of so many other Amerindian and old, old world peoples into this region. In some, as I commented earlier, following the strands to a particular, quote, pure, end quote, source of religious belief, practice, and mat materiality or iconography leads the scholar to adopting for analysis a conceptual approach like that of chemistry, of figuring out how to objectively disentangle compounds, mixtures, colloids, and so forth, or how to define the ingredients of a stewing ajiaco to use Ortiz's culinary metaphor. As Charles Stewart cautioned, religion is far too complex to apprehend it with such utopic objectivity. To comprehend where zones of aboriginal of aboriginal, quote, purity, end quote, and, quote, hybridity, end quote, come into being requires, as I have insisted, much more ethnohistorical or ethnographic documentation for the relevant period. What can be said with certainty is that after some 80 to 100 years of colonialism, a new Indio identity had emerged, one that is at once a conscious self-designation by Indios themselves and imposed by the colonial elite. The construction of Indio no doubt has multiple sources, but it also could have emerged only in opposition to other categories created by the colonial experience, for example, white, black, criollo, mestizo, etc. The other case, that of the cult of the Virgen de Guadalupe of El Cane de San Luis, just northeast of Santiago, in many ways parallels the arguments wielded for the Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre. The cult was introduced from Mexico to Cuba with the first icon of the Virgin taken to Santiago in 1664. El Cane was constituted as an Indio community in the 16th century. The Indios of El Cane found out about the Amerindian origin of the Virgen de Guadalupe of Tepeyac, Mexico. She appeared in 1531 to an Indio, Juan Diego Cuat La I probably completely butchered that. I apologize. Moving along, with such an Amerindian origin, the Indios of El Cane adopted the Virgen de Guadalupe cult as their own. The official cult in the parish of El Cane was that of San Luis, for which there was a church. By 1690, a small chapel dedicated to the Virgen de Guadalupe was erected by the Indios next to the, quote, big, end quote, church of San Luis de El Cane. By 1835, the city councilors, all Indios, had requested that the Virgin be relocated to, quote, the big parochial church, end quote, and displayed prominently as befitted the, quote, great lady whom this town had always regarded for patroness protector of all the Indios, end quote. The ecclesiastical authorities in Santiago permitted the relocation, but as Fernandez pointed out, with an air of prepotency and with disregard to a variety of petitions made by the Indio counselors, specifically that the Virgen de Guadalupe be placed in a lateral altar rather than in the central altar where the icon of San Luis remained. Quote, as can be appreciated from this episode, quote, end quote, says Fernandez, quote, the popular religiosity of these natives was neither taken into account, barely meriting a certain disdainful tolerance by the authorities in Santiago, nor were they given any power to decide for themselves in the affairs that directly affected them, end quote, 
despite the fact that in 1821, quote, a royal decree had proclaimed the equality of all free persons born or resident in the Spanish colonies, end quote. The old native chapel was demolished by the authorities so as to give the, quote, big, end quote, church a clear view from the plaza. By the last decade of the 1700s, the thirst for land ownership by the dominant white peninsular and white criollo oligarchy, with whom church authorities were identified, had become critical. In theory, a vast swath of the rural land in Oriente and Cuba was held in ownership by the crown. Such lands were called tierras prealengas, or royal lands, and any free subject of the crown could reside and settle there as long as it was cultivated or kept in production. Between 1758 and 1796, a barrage of lawsuits inundated the courts with the result of illicit and dubious encroachments on the Indios' rural, se rural settlements and farmsteads, coupled with accusations of sedition, which resulted in Indian rebellions against the oligarchs, not just in El Cane, but throughout the region. By the 1840s, a few years after the Virgen de Guadalupe was moved to the marginal altar, King Charles IV, having received complaints, quote, from those natural Indians, end quote, intervened with a series of instructions and decrees that, in Fernandez Perez's words, quote, would finally lead to the dispossession by the colonial authorities of the lands held by the community under the pretext that the aboriginal Indian race was extinguished, and likewise in the subsequent abolition of the Indian Ayuntamiento, or town council, whose foundation went as far back as 1629. From that time, in 1850, the community identity with Indio would begin to disappear, melting into the great stream of national identity. A clear symptom of this is the generalized adoption of the Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre, patroness of Cuba, end quote. Regardless of how many or how few elements of semiism can be identified in this last case, what does matter is that both Virgens were held as the key symbols of Indio identity and solidarity, and at least the Virgen de Guadalupe del Cane was held in stark contrast and opposition to the icon of San Luis, expressing quite blatantly the marginated social and political position held by all those who were seen by others as Indios, often in a deprecatory sense, and those who proudly identified themselves with their, quote, Indianness, end quote. The Virgen de Guadalupe is thus wielded out in the struggle for respect and identity, for fairness and humanity, against oppression and abuse of power, clearly implicit in the subordinated position that this icon held in relation to San Luis, who represented the interests and impositions of the dominating white class. These two case studies make one pause and think there are some universal features that are distinctive of the ideological struggles and, quote, war of religions, end quote, where icons are engaged because seen in its most irreducible structural relation, it's precisely what had led to the ritual competition and battles between Cacique Comendador and his rival. It is at the heart of why native, or Tainos, stole one, another, one another's semis or sought to control those that they thought would bring power and thus protection to them. Although, as I have said, the strands leading from these Marian cults to Aboriginal semiism and Tainones, as it was in pre-Columbian to early Spanish contact from the 1490s to 1510s, are still difficult to isolate. There are other kinds of evidence that point to native heritage. Manuel Rivero de la Calle, University of Havana, and Milan Pospisil, Yale University, as well as Richard Gates in 1954, have conducted bioanthropological studies among the communities of Yateras, north of Guantanamo in the late 1960s. Although the studies are based on somatic features, hemoglobin tests, and anthropometric measurements rather than DNA, the statistical and qualitative results strongly favor an Indo-Cuban or Aboriginal or Amerindian population that is significantly different from the rest of the population in Cuba. The studies also point to a strong degree of endogamy given the pattern of inherited pathologies and other somatic features that almost certainly have a genetic basis. The collected 
genealogies of the Yateras region inhabitants, for example, the Guabo settlement, along with other historical documents, show that some, for example, with surnames such as Rojas and Ramirez, had emigrated from El Cane in the 1750s. Rivero points out that the Rojas surname in Yateras, Tiguabo, San Andres, and El Cane is ultimately derived from Manuel Rojas, a nephew of the conquistador Diego de Velázquez, who had natives in encomienda as well as slaves, hence they adopted the master's surname, or in the case of the surname Ramirez, the source is traced to Bishop Miguel Ramirez, who was designated, quote, protector of the Indians, end quote. Obviously, the bioanthropological studies of the 1960s to the 1970s did not have the sophisticated technologies that are available today and thus can best be treated as encouraging possibilities of ancient native heritage lines. These connections will require additional research, albeit such studies would be difficult given all the ethical implications that any study connecting genetics to social and cultural identity has, especially in regard to potential redefinitions of, quote, Indio, end quote, or, quote, Indo-Cuban, end quote. And given that, apparently many of these Indio communities have gradually disappeared. The other arena to further elucidate the question of heritage and ancient Aboriginal cultural ancestries lies squarely in archaeology. The Cuban authors cited in this section repeat ad nauseum the large number of archaeological sites with evidence of pre-Columbian Taino and European assemblages, and rightly so. I mentioned earlier the case of Los Buchillones in Ciego del Ávila, as an instance of a native settlement persisting into the mid-1600s that retained what can only be regarded as a Taino and Aboriginal material culture, ranging from types of house structure to the portable artifacts, particularly the ubiquitous semi-icons engraved in a variety of items, including anthropomorphic figurines. The paraphernalia that are most likely related to semiism and Tainones at Los Buchillones strongly indicate a resistance to syncretism with Christian, African, and other Amerindian religious iconography, for example, colonial Maya immigrants. However, if there was any move towards syncretism, it has most certainly remained invisible in the archaeological record. This site alone, and assuming that the date range, A.D. 1295 to 1655, obtained from the wood beams of the house, reflects the actual age range of the occupation, strongly argues for the continuity of natives and the native way of life, or Tainones, from pre-Spanish contact times to well into the Spanish colonial period. This site was occupied at the time when the cult of the Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre began to emerge in the early 1600s. The village to which the Virgen del Cobre was taken, Barajagua la Vieja, has archaeological remains that span the period before and following the Spanish contact. It was excavated by José Guarch del Monte, but I have not been able to obtain the reports. Many more sites in the Mañabón hills, Banes, Mayari, Bayamo, Baracoa, Guantanamo, and Santiago areas in the Oriente province have yielded plenty of sites straddling the Spanish contact period, for which there are generally few published references. One of the problems of the reports I have read is that a good number of them describe the assemblages in typological terms in order to define each, quote, pure, end quote, population, i.e. what is Aboriginal versus Spanish or Old World. Their coexistence in strata or context does suggest, of course, interaction, such as exchange, trade, etc., with different degrees of intensity and frequency. But what the coexistence of such a mixture implies in terms of identity, social dynamics, and politics is not as well explored or published. It is assumed with good reason that such findings imply that syncretism and transculturation are present or eventually will take place, but the content of the processes involved in syncretism and transculturation have been neglected. It is not enough to assume or to note syncretism. The process... Uh-oh, I've lost my place. The process and the materials that document it need to be analyzed and described in relation to what they can inform about social, political, and religious arenas where the syncretic and anti-syncretic processes are at play in the construction of new identities, such as 
indio, mestizo, criollo, negro, indocubano, afrocubano, and so forth. The same critique applies to other greater Antillean islands. One way archaeologists can approach the data to build the evidence that interests me in this book is by focusing on precisely what's happening to the native religious icons and iconography, or art style, vis-a-vis -vis those of Christian or Afro-Caribbean authorship. When did the native semi-icons stop being produced in favor of adopted or locally crafted virgins or other Christian imagery? When did the personal body adornments depicting semi-icons, for example, pendants, statuettes, become accompanied by and then substituted with, for example, tin medallions, pins, or estampas, or cards with images, of the Virgen del Cobre? What can be deduced when both Christian icons and Indian semis are found together or in the same context? In what ways do local, or native, or popular, manufacturers of Christian icon of Christian icons reflect elements of continuity with the official church dogma. Are the deviations reflective of secretism? Although it is evident that Aborigines, for example, in Cueva, and later Indios in Barahagua, constructed shrines or adoratorios and chapels, there is still a notable absence of archaeological data on such structures. It is important to find and focus excavations on these to determine when and how both native semis and Christian iconography and paraphernalia occupied the same space as we know it did in 1511. Such archaeological excavations would contribute a plethora of new insights about ritual behavior that Encisos's and Martiz's 1514 accounts ignored. What happened to these native shrines, chapels, and their religious paraphernalia over time? When and why were native icons replaced by Christian forms? How did these chapels differ, differ from domestic household shrines? How did village shrines or chapels compare and relate to other loci of religious performance, such as the caves later used by the hermits? Burials are critical spaces of the analysis of syncretism and anti-syncretism because icons, votive offerings, interment practices, and placement of burials in relation to one another or social markers of class, class, age, gender, etc. And in relation to shrines or chapels can provide invaluable data as to what sorts of social religious behaviors and attitudes can be inferred from the mix of Aboriginal Christian, African, or Black Creole, and other Amerindian groups. Such studies have already produced fascinating results at Tipu, a post-classic slash colonial Maya site in Belize. Much can be learned by comparing the Caribbean situation with Hispanic Amerindian, quote, mission archaeology, archaeologies, end quote, across Hispanic occupied or conquered territories in the Americas. It is not enough to know that, for example, at Chorro de Maita, Circa 1000 to 1550s, a Spaniard's detached skull was buried at the feet of a Taino native, or that some of the natives had offerings made of tin cylinders or tin plaques via Spanish trade, or that Maholica wares intermingled with Pueblo Viejo or Chican Osteonoid, Aboriginal ceramics, and cow and pig bones were mixed with native Hutia, a rodent of the Capromide family bones and then say that this is syncretism in the works. We need to focus on the processes of syncretism, the spectrum of strategies that range from anti-syncretism, that which is rejected or resisted, at one end to syncretism, example adoption, mimicry, transculturation, etc., at the other. The cases of Cueva, of Cacique Comendador in Cuba, and the events at Guaricano in Hispaniola, or the scale of Areto icons as trophies of war by Spaniards in Puerto Rico provide glimpses of the endpoints of such a continuum of strategies. But archaeology is what is now left to fill the gaps in the record. I wish to conclude this section by reiterating what I think is a very important point. There is something of a profound loss in cultural diversity, or in blatant analogy to biodiversity, when the physical and visible symbols and materials of religious beliefs and practices are gone forever. As I read the cases of the Cuban virgins of charity in Guadalupe, 
The most striking feature is the absence or the loss of the kohoba ceremony, the inhalation of the magic hallucinogenic substances that allow ordinary human beings to invoke, dialogue, and negotiate with the semis. The other notable feature is that from the mid-17th century onward, there were no longer images and icons made that figure the semi-personages that were revealed through the kohoba, whose physicality and formal features visually expressed Tainones. The diverse cast of semi-personages had been curtailed or replaced by a different-looking cast of Christian personages. None of the Christian semi-virgins or saints were to function as the semiified ancestors of caciques or leaders. All of these are significant losses. Even if the shift was at first superficial, such as Mary, the mother of God of Cueva, or that of Comendador, and regarded as another, albeit quite different-looking, semi-icon in the 1510s, by the middle of the 17th century, the choices of ritual performance and paraphernalia were quite different from those of the cacique of Cueva or Comendador. If at first these were not always imposed upon natives by the conquistadors, for example, as is the cases of Ojeda and the anonymous sailor, I have little doubt that as the century progressed, Christian iconography was the only choice available to the Indios, as much as saints and virgins, as orichas, or lukumi deities, were also the only choice available to the African slaves and their descendants. Of course, in regard to Afro-Caribbean societies, I'm simplifying it here. Still, the native resistance did go on for much longer than what was assumed by the official histories in the Hispanic Caribbean, as the site of Los Buchijones suggests, but ultimately colonialism would create the Indio. His or her social and religious identities would be transformed beyond the recognition of any of their pre-Columbian ancestors. Part 6. Conclusions Chapter 22. Final Remarks this study is in many ways an extended essay. In its original Latin sense, the noun exegium means, quote, wait, end quote. Its verb form, quote, to assay, end quote, refers to the action and effects of probing and recognizing, i.e., waiting, evaluating, testing something before using it. As Karen Sykes noted, quote, the essay continues to find full expression, end quote, in anthropology. Quote, because the form continues to utilize the skeptical stance to the best advantage of making a critical contribution to wider knowledge. An essay is a try at explanation, no more and no less, and that can be quite enough, end quote. My emphasis. Such as they are, the conclusions I have reached in various sections of this book are an attempt at explanation. The book began with a healthy skepticism about currently held notions of Taino, Semi, Semiism, and of the individuals and persons involved. The explanations and conclusions present a logical argument based on the analysis of Spanish ethnohistorical documents, but also informed by archaeological data and anthropological theory. Certainly, these conclusions will need to be independently tested by further archaeological research that, for now, is not as rich as I would wish, especially for the set of semi-artifacts, idols, and other potent icons, that forms the material evidence of this work. On the other hand, I am encouraged that the theory on caciques and semi-idols interactions, agent-patient relations and personhood, presented here were productive and generative in a Popperian sense. They provide a baseline and coherent argument against which future archaeological research on native religions and their material correlates can be assessed and, hopefully, will stimulate an all-out debate about how we, as Western scholars, think about the natives as human beings and as agents. The arguments are constructed so as to force us to think about the consequences stemming from the relationships of humans with powerful and potent religious artifacts and, finally, on how these relations contribute to the construction and deconstruction of Tainones as well as new identities, such as the Indios of Spanish colonial times. I have purposely skirted the economic dimensions of the analyses and instead focused on the political-religious dimension that ideologically underpins economy. However, the economic implications are silently implicit in much of this work. 
In order to identify the peoples, agents, and actors engaged in semiism and semi-idolatry, I started with the critical overview of the cultures constructed through archaeological and ethno-historic research, leading to the conclusion that the Taino people and culture as a, quote, pure, end quote, homogenous and identifiable entity was an illusory, idealistic construction emerging from normative approaches in culture, in culture history. Instead, I've unabashedly borrowed Renier Rodriguez Ramos's notion of Taino-ness to express the spectrum, even mosaic, of societies that the notion of, quote, a Taino people, end quote, could not express. The Taino-ness that characterizes some of the native populations and societies of the Caribbean, I argued, arises from multiple and diverse lines of heritage, and its cultural contents are, at any time, contested and negotiated and always in the process of becoming. This dynamic process of contestation and negotiation found resonance with the concepts of syncretism and transculturation when later I analyzed the impact of Hispanic Christianity and its iconography on native semiism. I have made an effort not to use the classifier, quote, Taino, end quote, not an easy thing to do, in my discussions in large measure to accomplish one principal objective, to instill in the reader the idea that the focus of analysis is not on the labels that social groups could be given, but rather on the nature of the relations among various social groups and their material cultures, specifically semi-idols and icons. For this reason, I stuck with the use of, quote, natives, end quote, quote, Indians, end quote, and their geographic locus, of Hispaniola, etc., for example, or, quote, Tainoans, end quote. The overview of the archaeological record, taking as an example Puerto Rico, supports the notion of the plurality of ancestries and the diversity of expressions that gave rise to Tainones. Tainones, I concluded, is expressed variably among the inhabitants of the Greater Antilles. Having discussed Tainones as a variable spectrum of peoples and cultures, the analysis of the caciques and their semi-idols, or iconography, could proceed with the framework that is focused on the dynamics of individual agents and patients, caciques, and their semi-idols. In this book, I focused on caciques and their interaction with idols and other icons and things imbued with semi-supernatural potency. I strive to make sense out of the web of interactions spun by native rulers in eastern Hispaniola such as in Casimujigüe, Puerto Rico, or Borinque, and further afield in Cuba and the Lesser Antilles. I address the questions of what motivated and sustained the web through which semi-idols and potent objects flowed and humans interacted. I closely examined the nature of the face-to-face -face or agent-patient interactions between human beings and semis. In doing so, I have taken what I think is a fresh new outlook for the Caribbean how to fruitfully approach and appraise these interactions. I particularly made it a point, intentionally repeated ad nauseum, that the underlying nature and significance of the semis can only be understood in terms of the various social contexts in which human beings and these idols engaged as patients and agents, and doing so by positing that both the artifacts or semis and human persons are conceived not just as individual entities, but also as individual and partable. Semi-icon, semi-idols, like people, are multi-authored and exhibit different context-dependent natures, or are multinatural. They have properties of personhood that are owed, attached, or extended to, and incorporated by other human and non-human beings that are also individual and partable. Personhood and identity are not all about individuality. Individuality is also displayed in for example, their names or unique biographies. These human semi-idol relationships are framed in a worldview where nature is multinatural and where other beings and things are animated in animistic cosmos. This approach I have taken for analysis and interpretation is thus a departure from current Caribbean scholarship, where the Western and, mod and modern views of people and other beings and things are still largely anchored on the premise that natives and their material culture are indivisible and individually conceived. <laughs>
In the course of this study, I move from the very intimate relations between a human and the first manifestation of semi in nature to the broader network of extended relationships that humans had with them, focusing on inheritance, bequests, and gift exchanges with foreign and stranger caciques, and also the theft of semis. I have concluded that semi idols are individual persons and do have personal yet partable identities that are partly defined by the string of caciques, quote, owners, end quote, entrusted with them. The idols have names, titles, and ranks, and they also acquire biographies and reputations around which legends are built. And all of these features of identity and personhood, including the legends and biographies that justify their prestige, are created and recreated, composed, decomposed, and recomposed in the web of relationships with equally partable individual human beings, such as caciques, shamans, etc. I have shown that effective governance is not in the hands of caciques alone, but could only be implemented in concert with the panoply of potent semis as idols and as spirits. Inevitably, the analysis of this socially driven interaction, the web through which beings, human or otherwise, and animated things circulate or flow, led me to study the most fundamental of the driving force of sociality, which rests upon the principle of reciprocity, of gift giving and taking. Semi idols of various types were examined in light of how they, as individual, partable entities, as persons, were given and taken and explored what such exchange meant, for example, values, motivations, etc. The issues of the alienability and inalienability of, quote, keeping for giving, end quote, and, quote, giving for keeping, end quote, in regard to semi idols were confronted against the ethno historic data and nurtured by current theoretical discussions in sociocultural anthropology emerging largely from Melanesian and Polynesian ethnographic analyses. I pointed out that when seemingly inalienable possessions, such as a powerful three-pointer or an areto, were exchanged, they most likely could be gifted because regardless of physical separation, they would always retain in their personhood a quality or feature shared or derived from the originators or the donors. In this study, I concluded that because of the individual partable nature of the agents and patients, caciques and idols, there were circumstances in which seemingly inalienable icons were in fact gifted and that these often also involved both exchanging names, like in Guatiao, between caciques and the heroic genealogies of caciques and their ancestors chanted in aretos. Taking a clue from Alfred Gell's Distributed Person and Marshall Salins's Encompassing Heroic Persons, such as kings, chiefs, and their semis, I suggested that, quote, extendability, end quote, perhaps is a more productive conceptual property than the segregating characters of the inalienable, inalienable versus alienable dichotomy. This concept is not too far from the notion of, quote, galactic, end quote, relations proposed by Michael Heckenberger to describe the extended con configuration of chiefly power and relations across the Zingu landscape in Brazil and also in their ancient history via ancestors. I identified the all stone and fiber slash wood and elbow stone collars as a distinct and complex class of powerful chiefly objects slash semis that circulated only within a tightly knit set of related via intermarriage caciques who were geographically circumscribed to Casimujigüe and Boriqueng to areas of the Virgin Islands involving bridal exchanges that had deep historic roots going back at least four and a half centuries and possibly more. Such objects were evidently not traded outside these closely related chiefly lineages and polities. I also argued that some semi-idols, specifically the ancestor semis, such as cotton idols, skulls and baskets, or stone heads, would rarely circulate in reciprocal exchange systems and hence were more likely to remain within the descent group of the cacique. By way of contrast, of all the icons analyzed here, the guaisas, or face masks, that embody the living soul of the cacique were the ones selected for far-flung exchanges among foreign caciques. 
The Guaisas and the three-pointed Semis were most informative in regard to the complicated relations between Greater Antillean and Lesser Antillean leaders and caciques. In late pre-Columbian times, the extent of the Guaisas could be followed to Anguilla, to St. Martin, and reflected a web of relations that orbited towards Greater Antillean Tainones. Beyond, into the Windward Islands, the same icons could have been captured by belligerent societies that the Spaniards lumped as, quote, Caribs, end quote. Alternatively, I also suggested that some of the large three-pointed stones, or shell guaisas, reached the Windwards through exiled natives who brought them as they fled the battles and slave raids that raged in the Greater Antilles, and who sought and received asylum in islands such as Guadalupe, Cariacao, or La Desirade. For me, one of the fascinating aspects of the circulation and flow of semi-idols was to discover how closely it parallels the exchange, the exchange of brides slash women and the ritual of the reciprocal name exchanges, or guatiao, between caciques. The women offered as brides, the names of caciques offered in guatiao packs, and the semi-idols as persons are partable components of personhood that are reciprocally exchanged to establish bonds of alliance and cooperation. The motivations for giving or taking semi-idols slash persons are not substantially different from those of exchanging women as brides and names, or guatiao, between groups. I concluded that to exchange one's name is to give to another a part of one's identity at both a personal level and a group level. The name is that of the cacique's lineage. To give one's sister, daughter, or niece is not just a personal exchange of brides but one that takes on her descent group as a whole body, that is, as a fractal person. The betrothal is never just between two persons, but is also between two corporate kin groups, such as distinct bodies or persons, linked as affine. To bequest or give semi-idols or guaisas also entails giving and receiving individual persons, part of which remain attached to their original string of trustees, but that also provide new opportunities for developing relations, the stuff of which generates legends, biographies, and, in a word, history. I also showed that the same persons, the semis and women, are sources of conflict as much as cooperation. They both could be, and were, stolen or kidnapped, therefore leading to the rupture of the principle of reciprocity. Semis and women were agents and patients in promoting factional competition and conflict as much as in building cooperation and alliances. I have also compared the ancestor stoneheads with the Guaisas, a contrast that can be aptly characterized as vertical slash temporal versus horizontal slash spatial relations. The skeletal stonehead semis, as well as the cotton idols and human skulls placed in higueros, involve the connections and veneration of the living to semiified ancestors. Hence, they are about vertical relations, genealogical history, and memories. Instead, the guaisas involve connections between living humans, such as caciques, or leaders, who in addition are not initially connected by descent or by marriage. They are initially gifted to strangers, such as Columbus, or to, quote, native others, end quote, in the Caribbean. I concluded that the emphasis in Guaisa exchanges is not on the past, ancestors, or genealogical, historical depth, but on the present and the future, i.e. allies to be, with the emphasis being on spatially and socially expansive relations. Hence, they're horizontal. In examining the semi cacique relationships, one principal concern was in clarifying how the religious beliefs invested in these icons and on the cacique translated and on the cacique translated into political power and everyday action. It became clear that semi idols are equally engaged in the making and breaking of caciques and cacigazos. The key points made were that all semi idols are powerful and numinous from conception, but that their reputation as effective agents, or beneficial social production and reproduction, is not necessarily isomorphic with that of their human partner. Pairing potent semis with powerful humans, those with high rank, status, seniority, or antiquity, was the most effective combination. In other words, there is symmetry of power between high-ranked caciques and high-ranked legendary semi-idols that allows for effective negotiations and desirable outcomes. 
but if the cacique was newly installed then the relationship was asymmetrical in regard to power only time and experience could shift the power relations to a more symmetrical stance the battles of higüe and the rebellion of the caciques in puerto rico provided the scenarios of crisis in which to evaluate the shape or shapes that the relationships took between semi-idols other powerful objects allied caciques and spaniard enemies and spaniards or enemies the context is one of war battle skirmishes and raids and of strife misery and death such is the time when religious faith is always put to its ultimate test the division of loyalties among native caciques individually motivated by older pre-hispanic conflicts and enmities prevented a united resistance front against the spanish conquistadors and ultimately contribute to the, contributed to the collapse of tainoness and of traditional ways of living and interacting these battles provided details of the relationships that existed between caciques in Boriquen and Eastern Hispaniola, and a framework to understand the consequences of warfare when religion is ineluctably drawn into it, specifically in regard to the semis and semiism. The Spanish conquest spurred intense rounds of stealing semi idols between different competing caciques. The death in battle or by execution of caciques or their imprisonment along with the elimination of members of the caciques' lineage and household led to a severe crisis of accession to the office of chief. The heirs to the office were often not the preferred ones or the most able ones and would most likely lack the proper contingent of legendary reputable semis to effectively carry on the duties of a political and military leader. These political crises, with different degrees of severity, were likely to have occurred in the pre-Columbian past. The semi-theft was not just a new strategy that the natives developed specifically to respond to Spanish aggression. The same scenario, the same scenario of battle and warfare also helps to understand how caciques and military leaders of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands maintained or ruptured alliances with other diversely assembled ethnic groups and societies, including those homogenized as Caribs, island Caribs, etc., beyond their sphere of direct hegemonic political control, extending into a region described by Samuel Wilson as a buffer zone, a frontier land, quote, in flux, end quote. The analysis of battles in Hispaniola and Boriquen provided evidence about the religious and iconoclastic persecution of the natives specifically the destruction of their semi-idols and in some instances the confiscation of these potent semis and their sale in public auction as curious or even war trophies as was the captured luxurious canoe from native rebels in st croix the destruction of semi-idols and other symbols of political religious power by the spanish and also by caciques allied to the spanish led to the hiding of many of these images in the forests especially in caves which is where most of the museum quality specimens have been found this was exactly what the cacique of cueva in eastern cuba did with his newly adopted virgin semi-icon this dis the destruction of semi-idols was more than killing an icon in the eyes of the natives it was in effect killing a part of the cacique's personhood negating his or her potential potentiality as an extended distributed person and thus his or her capacity to rule the case of the destruction of Fray Ramon Panes' Catholic idols in Guaricano, in the Magua Cayabo chiefdom in Hispaniola, is a stark reminder that the, quote, war of the idols, end quote, was carried out for the survival of the native way of life. It is the first recorded incident, instance in the New World in which natives took the initiative to destroy the Spanish Christian power, and not the usual reverse situation. It reminds us that both the Spaniards and natives understood the power, not necessarily the theology, of each other's idols and religious symbols, virgins, saints, semis, realizing that the ultimate defeat or success of their respective traditions depended on wiping out each other's religion as much as it, as much as it did on killing and driving away the enemy. I argued that the clash of cultures led to a continuum of strategies regarding religion and its iconography. At one end of the spectrum is resistance, rejection, repudiation, and, in a word, anti-syncretism. At the opposite end is acceptance, adoption, mimicry, and, ultimately, 
syncretism and transculturation, perhaps in some cases, even assimilation. I concluded that in the 17th to 18th centuries, the syncretic process, still imperfectly documented and understood, had led to a significantly different religious complex in Cuba that would have been quite unfamiliar to their pre-Columbian or Tainoan ancestors. The processes of syncretism and transculturation, coupled with masking and transvaluation, went hand in hand with the construction of new identities, of what it was to be and to feel like a native, an identity that crystallized in the simultaneously racist and self-designated term Indio. The suppression of the ancient Cojoba rituals, I argued, was a substantial loss, one that was not syncretized. Its suppression by Spanish authority was precisely because the Cojoba ceremony was the key institution of governance, of political and military decision-making. The primary and most fundamental mode of engaging semis as icons or spirits was lost. Semiism without Cojoba is no longer Sebiism. Even if initially superficial, the instruction of, and eventual replacement by, the figures of the Virgin Mary and other saints of Christian iconog iconographic art, the idols' as faces, bodies, garments, and other accoutrements, no matter how much conceptual syncretism underpinned these images, is a drastic shift from a religion and imagery suffused with Tainones. The stories of the native-slash-Christian icons of Cuba and Hispaniola are paradigmatic examples of the political and religious conflicts and resolutions that were soon to follow in continental America as the conquistadors pushed forward in their quest for gold, glory, and the souls of Amerindians. Despite stark differences in their respective notions of what constituted victory in battle, the wars in Higüe and especially Borinquen demonstrate that the natives did engage to kill and harass the Spaniards and those natives allied to the Spaniards. The ultimate destruction of Tainoan semi-idols and the Cojoba ceremony closes a key chapter of effective native rulership and control over their future destinies. The, te the decapitation of the rebel native leadership stratum, caciques, bejiques, and even nitainos, coupled with religious persecution of their instruments of power, the semi-idols and the Cojoba ceremony, effectively ended the native political order and certainly decimated a huge block of knowledge about native religion. As Pané noted, it was the caciques and shamans, or bejiques, who held the unswerving faith in and deep knowledge of religion. The remaining native population was decimated not only by the wars, but also by the repartimiento and encomienda regimes, slavery, diseases, and by periodic but severe famines. The survivors against all odds, as the case of Cuba suggests, managed to create and reformulate new identities subsumed under, quote, indios, end quote, and to preserve at least echoes of the ancient idolatry, as defined by Alfred Gell and semiism. Still, far more archaeological work needs to be done to track down the substance and character of the process involved, be the syncretism, transculturation, or assimilation, and to flesh out the new webs of relations that emerged, not to mention of how persons were constructed and deconstructed. I suggested that whatever the specific content and character of syncretism in various regions may turn out to be, religious practices, cojoba rites, and of icon forms available to the aboriginal populations were severely curtailed. It is a well-known fact among Caribbean archaeologists of all theor theoretical persuasions that there is a lack of material evidence for social stratification that is independently supported by archaeological data. Among other things, this is because there is severe paucity of well-documented household units of clear stratification between households and mortuary practices, of evidence of differential accumulation of prestige and wealth items throughout a site, much less groups of sites, and of differential control over the distribution and redistribution of commodities and other resources. This paucity of archaeology data conspires against resolving pressing questions about the emergence and functioning of greater Antillean chiefdoms, or even of what kind of chiefdom, or even of what kind of chiefdom, were the casigazos of the so-called Tainos. Almost all of what has been written on the topic of chiefdoms has had no choice but to rely on what Antonio Curet and others call the, quote, tyranny of ethnohistory, end quote.
Alan Johnson and Timothy Earle have emphasized the importance of a political economic framework to address the casual processes that led to the general evaluation, evolution, as well as the particular historical development of chiefdoms or so called middle range polities. One of the key objectives is essentially to ascertain who controls what and how in order to financially sustain that polity and when such controls came into operation and for how long it was before these changed. Once this is defined and archaeologically documented, then one can ask questions about how and why a chiefdom developed a particular kind of configuration, a word I am stealing from the great Alfred Kroeber. Johnson and Earl identified two fundamental modes of financing a pre-industrial polity, both defined in terms of wealth. One is staple wealth, which involves modes of controlling the production, storage, and redistribution of food supplies. The other is prestige wealth typically centering on items deemed to be of high symbolic ideological and economic value. In this study, prestige or symbolic wealth includes the semi-idols in the form of elaborate three-pointed stones, stone heads, stone collars, elbow stones, wood and cotton idols, and guaisas. To these, one could also add dujos or seats, caona or gold, guanin, which is a copper, gold, silver alloy, Siba or stone, shell or coral beads making up of necklaces, making up necklaces and elaborate belts and sashes. By analyzing the behavior and patterning of the two kinds of wealth from secure archaeological contexts, one ought to be able to characterize the essential features of the economy that sustained a polity and identify who controls the wealth who produces it, and how these are put to use or consumed, distributed, and of course, exchanged. And by comparing these patterns with preceding ones or others that might follow in time, one ought to be able to address questions about causes for change as well as persistence. One of the results of this study is to raise the alarm and caution as to how archaeologists identify and then weigh or measure the usually polysemic values in the sense given by Graeber, of objects to be classified as prestige wealth. If this is the first step in identifying inequality leading towards social stratification, then we must ensure that the reasons for inclusion as wealth are defensible. Strictly economic arguments alone will not do in the case of semi-idols. The very elaborate three-pointers, wood idols, and stone collars, for example, would indicate that although the raw materials are not necessarily rare, in fact, they are abundant, their manufacture entails considerable investment of time and labor. They would be expensive to make and thus, in an economic sense, valuable. However, at least in the case of the three-pointers and carved, cojoba-related wood and stone figures, I've demonstrated that they've differently ranked values that are unrelated to the cost of manufacture. Two exact replicas of the same semi-icon will have different values owing to the reputations they have accrued during their lifetime as a result of different relationships with their human trustees. Although from conception each semi-icon is potent and powerful, they materialize as idols with different ranks and, hence, values that will not be apparent to us by looking at raw materials, size, decorative complexity, or by calculating manufacturing costs or man-hours. And, of course, there's also the question of their antiquity, the increased prestige value that these idols acquired as they circulated through generations of heirs or through a line of different caciques. Therefore, it's more than probable that there were examples of simpler and less elaborate semi-idols whose value by far surpassed that of other more costly to produce idols. In this regard, I'm not surprised that some of the archaeological contexts in which elaborate semis have been found do not necessarily point to elite households and instead were found in what amounts to a run-of-the-mill farmstead settlement, all with their single bate or plaza, as demonstrated in the Caguana area. In sites such as Utu 20, Cag 4, Utu 44, or Utu 27, Utu being Utuado and Cag being Caguana. I am not arguing that prestige value should exclude the cost of labor or time, but it's clear that this is not the only variable to consider in attaching to it a prestige value and wealth. Seniority antiquity can be ascertained archaeologically if and when we're able to demonstrate that the objects themselves have been curated, 
The wood idol is significantly older than all other artifacts and materials associated with it in a given st stratigraphic context. Finally, there are some basic steps that would be useful to take in the near future. A detailed Caribbean-wide study of the formal variability and changes through time of all the three-pointers would be invaluable to chart the evolution of semi-ideology from its humble beginnings involving small, private, personal religious icons to the much larger public ones of later pre-Columbian times. Precise analyses of the raw materials used could help in identifying quarry sources and areas of origin while stylistic formal analyses would shed light on the natures, personhoods, and identities of the sculptured semi-beings. Secure archaeological context for these objects should be made public. I strongly believe that many of the large, still unresolved questions regarding the nature of caciques and cacicazos, for example, hierarchical or heterarchical, centralized or decentralized, are dependent on how archaeologists appraise and evaluate the semi-idols as prestige wealth. I'm optimistic that as long as we, as archaeologists, do not lose sight of who the persons, human and otherwise, behind social action are and how they relate to others, to their material cultures, and to their world, we will be on the right track. All right, and we have officially finished Caciques and Semi-Idols, guys. Uh, the following pages are references cited photo credits and copyrights, and the book's index.